Hi, good morning everyone. Before I begin my presentation proper, I have a question here for everyone. Now, everyone here is more or less well versed in this area because we are currently doing advanced KCI, right? This question has been bugging me when I was doing my present when I was doing my presentation topic. And so I typed in this question to Google and these were the images that came out. Now, as we can see from these images, the similarities, we have a human factor and we have a computer factor. The interaction is what makes HCI relevant. We want to study the interaction by finding out the intersection between computer and human, how humans behave, our patterns and our habits, and have the computers facilitate to that. Now, to study how human behaves, we have to find out how our brain works. So how does our human brain works? I have a simple situation here. I don't know if you guys can see it, but it is, re it is relevant to most of the guys here who have ever been to the army. Now, Akao is having an IPPT three days later. He had an IPPT three days ago. So, feeling hardworking, he went to the stadium and he starts jumping up and down the steps. What do you think happened? What can you infer from these three sentences? Perhaps someone in front can give me an answer, like from the first two sentences, what can you infer? The guy in uh, green. Uh, you, yeah, you, don't do that. You. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what you Yeah, what, what do you think happened? Why did he, he's, he's having an IPPT three days later, but he just did an IPPT three days ago. Have you been to the army? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know if I understand what you like to infer this from these three sentences. I mean, what do you yeah, understand? He, did. uh, he, he didn't pass his IPPT. <laughs> yes, oh. that's okay. right. And he's probably in the army, right? Because he had to take IPPT over and over again. If you go to the army, you should know. So, after that, he went to the stadium and started jumping up and down the steps. What do you, what, which station do you think he filled? Any guys? Yeah. Yes, that's right. The interesting thing here is that I only gave you three sentences, the key information, and you draw assumptions from the three information, uh, the three sentences. This is how our human brain works. We base, we draw information and we make assumptions out of it. You paint a picture on your own and make up the whole story. Your assumptions are based on past experiences and knowledges that you probably study or research online or whatsoever and also memory if you recall last, there was a team a couple of weeks back who we did a lecture on memory we choose what to remember and what not to remember on a daily basis when we are experiencing certain situations now today my team is going to bring to you guys scripts, plans and situated actions script and plans are a study is a study. There is a subset. It's called scripts, plans, goals, and understanding by these two handsome guys over here, Shank and Abelson. The study basically wants to find out how human processes information, and from from that we can facilitate uh, HCI basically. Scripts, like previous example, you connect the pieces of information. And from that, you draw assumptions. Because humans are goal-driven creatures, we need a goal in our daily lives. And with the goal, we work, we work towards achieving the goal. We find out sequence of actions that are required to achieve the goal. Just like take coming to school as an example. Every day, when we want to come to, this, we want to, come to school, is, this is our goal. But from the time we step out of the house, taking the bus, the MRT, and walking to your classroom, that are, that those are the steps that are required to achieve the goal. But we often overlooked it because it's so routine. And because it's so routine, it becomes a script. That's what, that was how the concept scripts came about. I have another situation here, which is my own script. Now, I tend to visit hungrygoware.com. If you guys know what that is, it's a website that has reviews on foods all over Singapore. Now I find out what to eat. I go to the restaurant, I ate, 
and I left after paying. From these simple sentences, I draw a flowchart depicting the chain of events. Now, if you, if you realize there are some blanks over here, I visited hungrygoware.com. Why is that so? I, have, I need to have a reason for doing that, and that's my entry condition. Because I was hungry and I need to find a place to eat good food. Now, my goal is to satisfy my stomach. And to satisfy my stomach, I have to travel to the restaurant. I have to order a food. I have to pay and I have to finish eating it. Okay. Yeah. And those are the steps required to achieve my goal. Now, if you are wondering, what about situations that you do not plan for? No, I mean situations that you have not experienced before. Oh, sorry. The entry condition and the goal. So what about situations that you have not experienced before? Well, for that, we come to this thing called plans. Basically, in your everyday life, when everything is routine, we use scripts to process information, so it's very mundane. But what happens if you are in a situation that you have never expected? Like, for example, you wake up in the middle of the desert, you don't know what to do. So these situations are something you've never experienced before, and you have no knowledge of how to do them, other than uh, general knowledge or like scenes, shows you watch, things that you know. So, for a plan, you refer to a report, a report of general knowledge to process information. Here, basically in a plan, you determine what the main goal is, and, you, and after that you work out a subsequent list of goals, or sub-goals to, uh, for you to work on to, before you accomplish your main goal. So basically it's like goal equals action 1, action 2 plus action n. So basically, it's like a step-by-step -step guide of doing something. Let's say you want to build furniture from IKEA, they give you an instruction manual step by step. Those are your individual actions. Like first one, take out the screws, screw it into the, this plate, uh, this plank, that kind of thing. So eventually, you you reach a main goal of building your bed, furniture, whatever it is. And all these actions are are, driven, are generated from something called a plan box, which is your general knowledge. Like like how do you know you have to screw this here? How do you know this this plank goes there? Because you already know. It just happens from things that you already experienced before. So here I have an example. Basically, it says that, first one, I'm a freshie in NUS, and I have a lecture at TP Auditorium in 20 minutes. So, this is my goal. And because I'm a freshie, I've never been to TP Auditorium before, let alone know my way around NUS. So, my first step, I open up my Navy NUS app in my iPhone and find a way there. That's my first step. Second step is to, be, to key TP Auditorium into my app. Third one is to be find a the direction there, then board the bus. Board the bus, alight the bus, then enter the auditorium for my lecture. As you can see, that is how we humans process plans, uh, process information we have planned uh, for a situation that we've never experienced before. It, it's so natural to us that we don't realize it, but to put it in a concept, this is what humans do for situations that we never expect. But what I bet you guys are wondering as well, what if plans fail? Because nothing goes according to plan right most of the time. Yes, uh, I'm here to present an alternative action model that is the situated action model. Why do plans fail? Plans fail because they cannot plan for the now. They can plan based on your past experience, your past memories, or they plan based on guesswork, on like future predictions. But they, they cannot plan for now, like for the unforeseen circumstances, for the current context, for your location, your environment. You will never know what you are in until you are in it. Cheap, man. So, <laughs> so, one, uh, so there are two main causes of why plans fail. Number one is that humans seldom follow the plan. Humans seldom obey plans. So this is my wedding. Yeah, I was married last week and on Sunday. In any case. So as, as you know, weddings, we have a lot of plans. We plan like one year ago and we plan every single detail of the wedding, like from when to pick us up to uh, when is the lunch going to come in, and, things like that, and what food we eat, because yeah, some of, some of them went, yeah, they're there. <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, so what happened is that uh, our driver, we were early for the, for the ceremony, so our driver decided to take us out to drink some Milo, ice Milo, Milo pig, at McDonald's. So uh, what happened is that uh, my bride took the, took the Milo and spilled it on her dress, as in the year, of course. 
And so, so everyone is half panic lah. We, we didn't know what to do. Uh, it's like, you know, it was stained and there's only one dress. You cannot go and get another one, right? So, uh, what we did, when things did not go according to plan, is to apply to the action. So we actually hide the, hide the stain. So nobody saw the stain. I mean, I asked them, there's no stain. So because we applied situated action and we took the relevant action for the current situation and uh, knew what was necessary to solve the problem. Another reason why uh, plans do not go according to plan is because uh, machines, they, they, they find it hard to... Yeah, this is what happens when uh, machines <laughs> cannot handle events. Well, they cannot handle the unexpected events. It's because machines cannot handle inputs or uh, cannot handle events effectively. So this is what happens, they just give up and throw out a screen of them. Yeah, so these are the two reasons why plans do not go according to plan. One is that humans don't obey the plan and that machines, they can't handle the plan. So, uh, what is situated action? This is very important, if you know what I mean. Situated action is taking action for each uh, situation. Yeah, so it's very important. Okay, taking action based on each situation. So, uh, it's something of what we call the now factor. What is the now factor? It is when you situate the action says that yes, you can have a plan, yes, you can execute the plan, but when you are executing your plan, be sure to be aware of the current situation, the current context, the environment, the location, the, the time even, and see what is the current context that is not the same as what was planned. That is the now factor, having the now inside the action. Okay, so uh, next we have some learning points on what we can learn from situated action. Actually, there's only one. These two points are one. So, uh, instead of looking for a structure and trying to plan in details what are the things that are going to happen at what time, instead, we try to manage the interaction between uh, the context. So, instead of like, saying, okay, I'll, I'll do this, 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 this. No, instead, we try to manage it. We have an example now. So, for example, a conversation. So, in a conversation, you cannot plan for a conversation unless it's a presentation. Then you can plan on what to say. So, in a conversation, it's very hard to plan, it's very hard to go by scripts. So, it's a good example for situated action. So, one way you can manage the conversation is by turn taking. It's like a board game. So, you have player 1, player 2, player 3, player 4, player 5. Then, it's like, you take turns. And uh, in a classroom setting, for example, when later we ask any questions, you better raise up your hand and then we'll point out. And that's turn taking. Not all of you ask, answer the question at the same time, but take turns. Okay. So next one is adjacent pairs, whereby I'll ask a question and then you answer. And then uh, you ask another question and answer. So this question and answer way is actually uh, adjacent pairs. And later we have a little demonstration on that. And you all participate, right? Uh, lastly is agenda, whereby you have different contents of uh, different, a list of things that you want to talk about and go through it. All these are structures, all these are plans, yes, but they are not so detailed. and. They are not plans on what you have to say. They are plans on how you manage the interaction. And that's the difference. So uh, now we have some limitations on situated action. Yeah, this also you need to take notes because later you know why. <laughs> okay, so uh, number one is conditional uh, relevance of response. What this means is that you give a relevant response. For example, if my wife asks me, am I fat? So should I answer her yes or no? Yeah, it, that the relevant response is you are beautiful, because uh, I mean the, my wife is not asking me if she's that she's asking me for affirmation whether she looks nice or not. So uh, the problem with machines is that they do not understand these implicit meanings. They do not understand the context of the question, and they probably reply a no, which is a lie. <laughs> <laughs> communicative breakdown or another a breakdown in communication what this means is that uh, you have a machine and you have human and they have to communicate but what happens if they don't communicate like cold war yeah then you have communication breakdown so there are two types of communication breakdown one is false alarm whereby something is not wrong there's nothing going wrong but then you know the machine tells you that there's something going wrong like for example this you know uh, professors hate this because I don't know why it always appears on their screen wherever they are giving presentation. But it's like, it gives you like 
a minute or thirty seconds to respond. It's thirty seconds to respond is not a short, it's not a long time for a professor. And yeah, it, it looks like a warning. It, it sounds like a warning, but it's not a warning. It's an update which is not that important. It, there's nothing going wrong, but it tells me that okay, I better respond before it, it restarts for me. And that is a false alarm. I mean, I don't need to restart and tell me five minutes for Windows to start up. Windows computer only has this. Not me. <laughs> Maybe that's why it's confused. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the next type of communicative breakdown is garden path. What this means is that there is something going wrong, but at the same time, I'm not informed of it. The, the, the machine did not tell me that there's something going wrong. One example is our SOC printer. When you run out of quota, when you have low of toner, the, uh, the machine does not tell you that, okay, hey, I, I, got, I cannot print for you. No, it does not say that. It just say, okay, print job is sent. Then print job sent, then you expect printing to come up. You go there, oh, low toner, voila. You wait so long for it. In the end, nothing happens. That is garden path, where something is wrong, but the machine does not tell you. Yeah, I believe SOC can work on it. Especially with SCO competition. So uh, that is the end of our presentation. And uh, we have talked about plans and scripts and situated action. That's how we talk about the demonstration of adjacent plans. So now I will ask the question and your answer. How is it connected to HCI? How is this situated action and uh, plans and script connected to HCI? People from the floor, please. Uh, or you only need some time to think. How is situated action and plans and scripts uh, linked with HCI? <coughs> How can we apply it? What are some of the real world applications that uh, you see around you? Three questions. Basically, it's an input process output. So, what are the input? How can we facilitate the machine to have more inputs so that it can make a better decision? Okay, how can we make clear the, to the user the limits of the machine, like what's going on or what's wrong, and how can <coughs> yeah, how can we find ways to compensate for the machine's lack of resources? So, for example, a machine is very limited; it is in a box. I mean, what can you do? It, it has a front camera, a back camera, a keyboard, and a mouse. It can't sense things. I mean, it can't uh, say, OK, I know the aircon is cold, and I need to turn it up, which is, yeah. So uh, how can we facilitate the machine in knowing that uh, the outside information, the situation? These are some of the questions we can ask ourselves when we are doing our project for the presentation. 